Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, with the Registered Farm Partnership deadline approaching, I'm joined by Chagas Collaborative Farming Specialist, Gordon Peppard, to get an insight into what you need to do to set up a farm partnership, its benefits and implications. Gordon, you're very welcome. At this time of year, farmers are starting to consider various farming options in advance of submitting the basic payment in May. Yes, thanks for having me on this evening, Catherine. Yes, although registered farm partnership applications can be accepted and processed at any time during the year, there is a looming deadline for 2022, and that deadline is the 11th of February 22. If you want to have a registered farm partnership number in time to apply for the BPS in May 2022. Can you explain, Gordon, what the farm partnership is or what is the difference between a normal farm partnership and a registered farm partnership? Yes, so I I suppose a registered farm partnership, it's a formal business structure or a formal arrangement that's recognised by the Department of Agriculture. Um, A registered farm partnership, it must have a minimum of two partners, but it can have up to a maximum of 10 partners. And I suppose there's there's two different types of partnerships out there. There's the intra-family partnership, and that is a partnership where you have either a father or mother who goes into partnership with their son or daughter, or there could also be an inter-family registered farm partnership, where maybe, for example, two neighbouring farmers want to join together for to increase scale or to increase efficiency, and that is also a viable registered farm partnership. And who is eligible to join into a registered farm partnership, Gordon? Yeah, okay, so to, to form a registered farm partnership, first of all, you need a category one applicant. And what is a category one applicant? Well, that is a farmer who is farmed in their own right on a minimum of three hectares for at least the previous two years. So if we look at a family partnership, you generally would have the father or mother who would have farmed for a long number of years on the home farm in their own right. So they would qualify as a category one applicant. The second person then in the partnership they have to be another category one or a category two applicant. So to be a category two applicant, you have to have a minimum of a level six agricultural qualification, and you must get a minimum of a 20% profit share in the registered farm partnership. That's great, Gordon. And for farmers that are considering going into a farm partnership, what are the benefits that they'd see? Yeah, so that's a very common question, I suppose. And I always try and break it down into two main areas. So I look at the social benefits of a registered farm partnership, and then we also look at the financial benefits. So if we take it from the social benefit, we'll take it from a family registered farm partnership in a family situation. It really is a natural progression of the farm business and the, and it starts the process off of maybe the transfer from, from one generation to the next. It's bringing a young person into the farm business where everybody is recognized in the business, whether that be from a financial or a physical management point of view. There's also the added benefit that you now have two or maybe three people involved in the business and it can, you can have a shared workload where it's often very difficult now on farms to get labor, or to get suitable labor. And this, this helps with the work-life balance. Now, if you want to go away for a weekend or there's a family wedding or a funeral, There's two or three people who know the farm business and they can carry it on while you take your time off. The young person in these scenarios, they often bring new skills, new technologies and an energy and enthusiasm to drive the business forward as well. And in many cases, farms can be dangerous places to work with stock or machinery. And now if there's two or three people working on a farm, farms can be much, much safer places. So if we turn over to the other side then and look at the financial benefits, one of the main benefits there is, I suppose, maximizing the low rate of income tax. Depending on the number of partners you have and the profit sharing ratio agreed, you can maximize the the amount of income coming into into the farm. This obviously will all be done in conjunction with, with your accountant. If we look at some of the schemes, then you've got things like TAMs. So an individual is allowed an investment ceiling of up to 80,000 of a spend. But if you're in a registered farm partnership, you can actually double that to 160,000 and get grant aid. And the young trained farmer, if they qualify for that category, they can get a 60% grant on the first 80,000. 
Some of the other schemes then is there's a young farmer scheme top up there at the moment, and that's a top up on up to 50 entitlements at roughly 67 or 8 euro per entitlement. Now, do bear in mind, I suppose, we're, we're in a bit of a transition and cap reform has taken place in 2023. So these are the current situations for the moment. Things may change as we go forward. I suppose stock relief is another one there. If you are developing a farm or increasing stock numbers, a young trained farmer is entitled to stock relief of 100% there for four years. And the other partners in the Registered Farm Partnership can avail of a 50% stock relief. So very, a very valuable resource there if you're, if you're um, increasing stock numbers on a farm. If we look at the Collaborative Farming Grant then, um, it's there to encourage people to get the best advice in terms of finance, legal and advise, agricultural advisory. And there is a grant there of 50% on a maximum spend of 5,000 for joining the Registered Farm Partnership. That's great, Gordon. And what do farmers need to do to establish a farm partnership and what documents are required? Yeah, so there's there's a number of things there that are required. And I suppose the first one is, is, a, is an application form. And, and that's quite a simple form in terms that it's just your name, address, herd number, and the profit share and ratio. But there's a few more substantial agreements then that need to be completed. The first one, I suppose, is the farm partnership agreement. And this really needs to be done in conjunction with your accountant. The accountant will need to register your business with, with revenue to obtain a tax reference number. They will also need to create a capital account, and this outlines what every partner is bringing to the business on day one. They will also help you to agree on a suitable profit share and ratio to maximize tax. And I suppose it's probably also a good time to talk about future farm succession and maybe taxation that might be coming down the line in terms of a land transfer. One of the other agreements then that's required is a non-farm agreement. And that's a really around the table a, a form that needs to be filled up with all members of the partnership, just to outline different areas of responsibility, um, what hours are to be worked, what time off is agreed, how much is to be paid uh, per week or per month, et cetera. The other thing then is the bank account. Every registered farm partnership must have a designated bank account that has the name that has the names of all partners on it. So you will have to go into your bank and open up a new bank account and all the transactions and all the money from the farm must go in and out of that bank account. Just a couple of the other things then, you will also need to show the folios of your land to show that you own the land. And if you're coming in as a category two applicant, you will need to show your, your certificate to show that you have a minimum of a level six agricultural qualification. So look, there's, there's quite a number of things there to be gathered together, Catherine. Um, and also maybe depending on what type of a partnership you're going into, there may also be herd number changes and you may need to talk to your local regional veterinary office to add names onto an existing herd number. But that advice can be obtained from your agricultural advisor. That's great, Gordon. And I suppose you've seen hundreds of partnerships formed and there is a fear among farmers. There is a change in moving into a partnership. What has your experience been? Yeah, that's, that's a very valid point, uh, Catherine. And I, I think some of the main ways of alleviating those fears is to talk to people and talk well in advance of joining the Registered Farm Partnership. The first thing you probably should do is sit down around the table with who, with the people you're hoping to go into the partnership with and just discuss how do you think this is going to work? How will it pan out on the ground? But also maybe to talk to farmers that are already in a partnership and to see what are the pluses and minuses that they've encountered and how they've overcome them. But you'll also need to highly involve your accountant and your agricultural advisor just to, to go through all the relevant information agreements and to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Obviously, farm partnerships is only one of a number of farming collaboration agreements, Gordon? Yes, there's there's a number of collaborative farming arrangements out there. For example, long-term land leasing, share farming, contract heifer rearing, to name a few. And I suppose, look, if you want any further information on those, it's probably best to talk to your local Chagas advisor. And if you want any further information on forming a registered farm partnership, the Department of Agriculture have all the relevant documents on their website and your local advisor will also have all the relevant information available. 
That's great. Thanks very much, Gordon, for your insight into farm partnerships. And I'll include the links to the website in the podcast text. Great. Thanks, Catherine. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Gordon for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie. Or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.